Welcome back to Film Inflicted Trauma. Some of you may have noticed we haven't posted an episode of this series for a long time. Others may not have even realized that this series existed. Either way, we've been tinkering with the show for a while in order to get ready. The way we were doing things just didn't work for us anymore. We think it's a dead format. So we've been hard at work behind the scenes experimenting with new ways to do things. Rigorously tested, of course, by the R&D department that we don't have. So this is the grand relaunch. We're starting with the Newly Deads because the original review was our first try and we'd like to do it right. It's also the movie that started our love affair with one of the strangest producers we've yet come across. Ah, Joseph Merhi, the Fellini of feculence, the Bertolucci of bullshit. The Newly Deads was our first exposure to his body of work, but good God, people, this guy made so many movies. That's really the most fascinating part of his career. So many terrible, terrible movies. So in light of the big damn relaunch, we decided to start with what we hope to become a recurring theme month. Welcome back to Film Inflicted Trauma. This is the Merhi Merhi Month of May. Joseph Merhi started his career in 1986 with a short-lived production company called City Lights. It specialized heavily in rogue cop and vigilante criminal type movies. Later, he left City Lights to form PM Entertainment with producer Richard Pepin. New company or not, they stuck pretty loyally to the bad action and schlock horror genres. The dream team of producers, Joe Merhi, Rich Pepin, and Sean Dash, came together to poop out the Newly Deads, a movie that is so confused it doesn't know if it wants to be a ghost story or a hate crime. In the late 80s, a weary traveler stops at a secluded bed and breakfast, where she is wooed and sweet-talked by the mustachioed manager, Lloyd. However, it turns out that the traveler, Jackie, is a transvestite at the least, or most likely transsexual, rather than a biological female. The movie is very unclear about this. Discovering this sends Lloyd into a blind rage, despite Jackie actually apologizing and pointing out that she thought he knew. I thought she knew. Lloyd then proceeds to kill her in a fit of adolescent homophobic rage. What does this have to do with anything? Well, everything and nothing, because it's the crux of the movie while being glazed over so thoroughly you'd think this film was directed by Krispy Kreme. We fast forward 15 years to Lloyd's wedding. Also, he must have inside him the blood of kings because he hasn't aged a day in 15 years. <laughs> Jackie is back as well, only this time she's a murderous rage ghost who appears at his wedding to declare that if she can't have him, then no one can. The rest of the cast consists of Ron, a boring non-entity, his wife Chris, who thinks that she's psychic and is prone to panic attacks, and a metric shitload of nameless nobodies who exist for no reason other than murder fodder. Jackie works her way through the hotel, murdering all of the newlywed couples and tormenting Lloyd through his new fiancé. I'm not sure what she has to do with anything, but it shows results. So I guess it's a strategy. In the end, Chris uses her psychic powers and a lot of Christian imagery and nobly sacrifices herself to put the revenge spirit to rest and save Lloyd's life. Did you catch that? Just in case you missed something somewhere along the line, the movie ends with Chris sacrificing herself to save Lloyd from Jackie's revenge. Yeah, that happens. Remember when Lloyd murdered Jackie in cold blood? Remember how this entire thing is completely and totally his fault? Well, forget all of that, because Jackie had the audacity to be queer! I got this movie in a trauma box set thinking it was going to be just another run-of-the-mill horror film with no budget, but oh man, it's so much more than that. This is utterly reprehensible. Look, I think we can all agree that committing hate crimes is a not-that-cool kind of thing to do. No matter how hard this movie tries to confuse the issue, Lloyd is the villain here. The film tries to gloss over this little point, but we can't help but feel that the murderous revenge ghost has a legitimate grievance. Lloyd didn't take her parking space or burn her toast. He stabbed her in the head with an ice pick. More damning still is the constant assertion that Jackie wants this man for herself. There's the scene where she tells him that no one else can have him. What is this, Lloyd? I'm not gonna let you have anybody but me. There are multiple scenes where she takes the place of people who are kissing Lloyd so she can get at him. And there's the point where Chris realizes that Jackie just wants to go to bed with Lloyd. There's something you're not telling me. Tell me! Tell me! She's a man. He wants you. I don't know. He wants to go to bed with you. Yeah, yeah, I guess. 
that's what this is really all about, despite the fact that Lloyd came onto her first. So I guess the moral of this story is that the gay invader is evil for daring to be herself while not having the right shape of genitals that the straight man wants to fuck. Great story, guys. You are mind cancer. Well, we can all pretty much agree that this film is garbage, so why don't we just go ahead and look at a few of the highlights? Well, for starters, there's the opening the bottle scene. Feast your eyes on the steamy, sultry sequence as Lloyd offers Jackie some of his hotel's finest vino. Try not to get hot and bothered as this succession of sexual cinema unfolds before your eyes. They'll sell you the whole seat, but you'll only need the edge. Then there's the big reveal. You'll start off by wondering if they are purposefully trying to avoid showing the audience Jackie's face, or if they're just shitty cinematographers. I'm thinking, yes. You can't take that road because we're gonna have an accident. I just saw it. Oh, Chris, please, don't, don't start this shit again. It's not shit, Ron. Chris and Ron, driving and screaming. This is quality cinema at its finest, folks. They argue because Chris is convinced that she's psychic and Ron doesn't believe her. Probably because that isn't really a thing. Oh, I disagree. I am, in fact, a powerful psychic. You are. Yes, and in fact, the phenomenal cosmic power that coalesces in my psychomantic brain meat is filling me with the secrets of the future. Really? And what are they? This movie will suck. Dear God. He's a witch! That is just uncanny. Anyway, this movie is unmitigated drivel with nothing to recommend it. Nothing that is, except... Captain Mike! Oh, Captain Mike, you delightful drunken dynamo. Batten down the hatches, splice the main brace, and set us on a course for fantastical whimsy. Who is Captain Mike, you might ask? Why, he's the one shiny element of pure delight in an otherwise bottomless tank of sputum. Outside of that, we don't know. The man is a complete mystery. Captain Mike made such an impression on us in this first review that he became sort of a catch-all expression for the one great thing in something we otherwise hate. The one shining moment in a cavalcade of disappointment. So who else knew that this was actor Doug Jones' first movie? That's right, before he was Abe Sapien, the Silver Surfer, or the Fawn, he was an awkward goofball composed almost entirely of spindly limbs. You know what? Why hasn't Doug Jones been cast as the Slender Man right now? Look out, Murder Stash! Your wedding is under attack by the sashaying dead! And who could possibly forget the Doug Jones hot tub blowjob extravaganza? Boy, I like this place. I love the part where Lloyd is trying to get his new wife to comfort him, and she just makes fun of him for believing in ghosts. What a nerd! Why can't you believe me? I think I'm the only one that can see her. No, 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 no. That's not funny. There are actually a metric but ton of characters in this movie, but it'll never tell you their names and you wouldn't remember them anyway. Ooh, let's have a character murder montage! Well, looks like pretty much everyone's dead. Seems like as good an excuse as any to quit watching this garbage. I'm a goddamn dirty son of a bitch if I don't bring back Chicago. <laughs> Captain Mike! You know what? I don't even think he knows he's in a movie right now. I think he just wandered by and started marrying people like some kind of drunken clerical Johnny Appleseed. Greetings. I suppose you're wondering what brings me here to your Garden of Eden. <laughs> Look at him. He's like a gazelle. Beautiful and fragile, like a snowflake. You couldn't marry us without a couple of hits. Oh, if you insist. Over the hills, let's go, <laughs> men. Girl, too. We're shoving right off, we're shoving right off again. Nobody knows where or when. Also, Ron is dead. Wait a minute. How did Jackie manage to kill him on that patio? There are like a million witnesses. Are they being haunted by Solid Snake? Not to mention the fact that Chris screams like a banshee when she reveals his death. Owen, oh, good job on picking up his head by the hair as if you already know that he's dead. Real convincing. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we'd like to introduce a new segment here on Film Inflicted Trauma. We'll show you a scene from the movie, clipped out on its own, and challenge you to figure out just how the hell it fits into the rest of the movie. 
Welcome to Without Context. Okay, dear, here's your, here's your question. What's the term for a young fox? Passion. Passion? Passion? This is not sex. Fox. A baby fox. And that just about wraps up the Newly Deads. Again. Join us next time for another journey in failed film fuck wittery. Over the sea, let's go. Hey guys, thanks for watching. While the credits are rolling, feel free to click here to go check out our RPG reviews at Roleplay Roulette. Also, check the links in the description because it'll take you to see the awesome music that we have in this episode. Come on, check it out, guys. If you do, I'll take my shirt off. I'm not gonna take Whoa, transvestite, back off. Wait a sec, pre op or post op? Pre op. <laughs> Dear Princess Celestia, I've learned that one of the joys of friendship is sharing your blessings. It helped me to learn that we all have hidden talents, and if we're patient and diligent, we're sure to find them. I was so afraid of being thought of as a show-off that I was hiding a part of who I am. My friends helped me realize that it's okay to be proud of your talents, and there are times when it's appropriate to show them off. I am happy to report that one of your youngest subjects has learned a valuable lesson about friendship. Sometimes the thing you think will cause you to lose friends and feel left out can actually be the thing that helps you make your closest friends and realize how special you are.